thank you for coming. Thank you so much for having me. A uh, big thanks to Samuel and Alex and the Japan Society Northwest and the JET Alumni Association. And special thanks to Zoe and Duncan and the rest of my team for making this possible. I want to share a little bit about my background with the Gion Festival. I first encountered it in 1990. I'd just gone to Japan to teach English right after university. And uh, to be quite honest, I thought that the festival was really boring. I just saw these big uh, floats kind of standing in the middle of the road. And um, I didn't know what they were for, and I didn't know what they were doing, and I didn't know what was going to happen. And I, I felt a little bit bad for the Kyoto people that they had such a a poor excuse for a festival. I'm, I'm just kind of outing myself here. What a, what a very prejudiced perspective I had as a, a young American woman. I'd been to Mardi Gras the year before, and that was my idea of a festival, like loud, lots of stuff happening. And as it turns out, I found out later that I, I just happened to go kind of on the, at the wrong time. I went on the first night when they were really just setting up. And um, this is part of the dilemma is that the festival runs for the entire month of July, but until really until it's all changing now because of social media, but until my book and until social media, you really had no idea as a visitor what was happening when, and you know, I have one day to go, what can I do? And, and th that was not known at that time. And so I spent a lot of years really just kind of walking around and stumbling onto things. And sometimes uh, there were these amazing, wonderful discoveries and, and other times it was quite miserable. It was just hot or pouring rain or, uh, extremely humid and, and so on. And so part of what I am trying to do with my book on the Gion Festival and uh, through presentations like this is to help people like you really enjoy your experience. The Gion Festival is a true marvel. I think it's a, well, it's rightly so a World Heritage event. And uh, I'd like uh, people to be able to enjoy their visits there. And also for the people who are putting on the festival to really get the respect and appreciation that they deserve for making something so wonderful available to all of us. So the next time I experienced the Gion Festival was two years later, 1992. And by chance, I was living in the Gion Festival neighborhood. And I, I was actually ignorant of that fact, but I walked out my door one day and I bumped into a float. And uh, that was very arresting. I just wondered, where these textiles in particular were from. And some of the things look like they're telling a story or they have a meaning. And I, I wondered what those stories were, what those meanings were. This is a textile that decorates one of the floats, very rare worldwide. And the Gion Festival textile collection is an internationally renowned collection because it's so unusual and extremely diverse. International textile people from around the world all know about the Gion Festival textiles. But this was the year, just by chance, 1992 was the year that this was discovered. A book was written about the Gion Festival textile collection, and I wrote an article on that. I also wrote about women's participation. It is officially an all men's festival. And 1992 was the first year that they allowed some young girls to start participating in the musical troops rehearsals. And so I wrote an article about that too. And, and textiles and, and women in the festival have remained an ongoing interest of mine. The festival seemed really interesting, but the information was so inaccessible. So it was just walking around looking at stuff, which I found a little bit boring, not really knowing what it is. That's me in 1998. I thought, well, I'll, I'll try and find out some more about the Gion Festival. And so I would ask a lot of questions. And uh, the Gion Festival neighborhood communities, some other Japanese people told me, have actually been famous for centuries for keeping people out, for, for keeping out outsiders, for being very insulated. And this was not actually my experience. I found them to actually be very warm and hospitable. And when they sent, I think because they sensed that I was sincere in my interest, uh, when I found people who know, knew about the festival, they were quite happy to answer my questions, which was amazing. And I kept going to the festival, kept asking questions. And I have to confess that I really focused a lot on what I could get. 
I wanted to find out information. I wanted to get a lot of photos. I wanted to get access. And I really had this hunger. And it was, it was well motivated. I, I thought the festival was amazing. And, uh, but, but I was very focused on, on what I could get. And uh, there was a lot of suffering involved in this process, uh, especially once I moved away from Japan around um, in the early 2000s and I would go back and uh, jet lag is real. I was suffered from jet lag. The heat is quite extreme. It's in the high 30s a lot of time. It is the rainy season. The Gion Festival takes place during the rainy season. So it's very humid. And uh, basically I didn't really know people and I would just walk around and say, would you talk to me? And sometimes they, they're really busy. They have a lot going on during the Gion Festival. So uh, to, for them to take time out and talk to someone they don't know and they don't know why, that was asking a lot of people. So it, it was challenging circumstances. And I, I realized over time that how much my attitude was, was shaping my experience. I started to approach it more as a participant. I started to play a little bit more with my attitude and my view and my, you know, how do I want to experience this festival? Do I want to experience as someone who's kind of coming in from the outside and trying to get something? Or do I want to experience this as someone who, I'm not exactly part of the community, but I lived in Kyoto for a long time. I wanted to support the Gion Festival. I thought, well, I'm kind of, I'm supporting it in a different way as an international person. And, and that's in this day and age, a very valid approach, I thought. And so I tried to train myself to start to surrender more to being a part of the festival and experience the festival that way, rather than being an, an outsider trying to come in and, and get things. The Gion Festival was founded in the year 869, so it makes it more than 1,150 years old. And it was founded amidst a terrible epidemic. There were bodies in the streets and the healthy people were trying to help the sick people and then the healthy people would get sick. You know, they'd get so tired, their immune systems would be weakened. So it was really quite a terrible terrible scenario. And um, in those days, of course, people really believed in things like hell on earth, right? They thought, what happened? We've, we've got hell on earth. And a tremendous amount of suffering was happening. On average, Kyoto had epidemics one in every three years between the years 808 and the year 1000. And thanks to my friends at Craft Tabby for that statistic, you would really be in fear for your life. Uh, in that kind of scenario. Every summer there's a rainy season and that continues today. At the bottom, you can see uh, the men's uh, clothing is, is wet up, and up to their knees. So this is the very beginning of the festival, the very beginning of a, what's a, a three hour procession. So you can imagine that by the end, they're quite soaked. Their feet are gonna be covered in blisters. It's, it's also very hot. So they're just gonna be damp to the bone basically and hot. And um, so optimal conditions for getting sick really. And sometimes the Gion Festival takes place amidst typhoons even, that's how extreme it can get. Nowadays, we can work with this. We go home, we, we dry off, we rest up, we, we take some echinacea or, or something. And, uh, but, but back before modern hygiene and back before antibiotics and so on, uh, people suffered a lot from things like cholera and dysentery and related illnesses. In addition, the, the, water, the water would be standing so uh, once the illnesses started, they, they spread very quickly and they still call it the summer sickness and elderly people still alive today have told me that when they were young children, some of them had family members die from, from this illnesses before antibiotics were brought in. And uh, they also said that at the end of the summer, they're like, oh, we made it another year. They still have this sense of like surviving the summer. That's very real to them. So the Gion Festival is very much about rainy season, which means it's very much about water. And for a time, I thought, because I've been studying this for more than 25 years, for a time, I thought, well, with antibiotics and so on and hygiene we, and science, it's not really an issue anymore. But I really started to change my view about this because if it's about water, it is also about 
climate change because the weather patterns are, are definitely changing. The last two or three times I've gone to the Gion Festival, it hasn't rained at all during the festival, which is a bit odd and is challenging for their crops, for example, for their agriculture, for their rice, which as we all know is very central to Japanese culture. And although it didn't rain during the festival, one year there was massive flooding before the festival, the previous month, June, and all of Japan's amazing engineering capabilities could not prevent really terrible floods and uh, rivers bursting their banks. And there was a, a terrible amount of, of uh, death and destruction from those floods. So in a sense, I, I feel that the, the meaning of the Gion Festival is, is still there. Its raison d'etre is still there. It's intact and it's, it's shifting a bit as, as we change, as the planet changes, as our, our approaches to how we live change. So to, to recap, the first Gion Festival was basically a supplication to the gods to, to help, help us uh, get over this epidemic and uh, please help end this suffering. And uh, an interesting thing that I've uncovered just recently is the first festival was called a Godyo A. So A is meeting and Godyo is honorable spirit. So the emperor uh, and the people who called the first Gion festival, they invited honorable spirits to come and help. And it took place at this pond that was part of the Imperial Palace grounds called the Shinsen Inn Pond. And amazingly, this pond is still there today and it is still part of the Gion Festival route. It's, it's quite a spooky place. It's so very appropriate for a place where they were going to kind of pray to spirits for the end of, of plagues. Godyo, these spirits can be powerful and they are helpful. The belief system was that they had the power to help end the, the plague. Now they have a counterpart called an ondyo. And an ondyo is a vengeful spirit. So ondyo are kind of the opposite. They might cause plagues, they might cause disasters, and then godyo can overcome them. This, this is really interesting. This is a key point, and this is very relevant for us as modern beings because it basically mirrors modern psychology. We can pray to ondyo, or we can and inspire ondyo with our the goodness of our lives, with our virtue, with our sincerity, with our determination. We can purify ourselves and we can inspire ondyo to become godyo. So we can inspire the vengeful spirits and they of their own accord become helpful spirits, right? So we, we can uh, kind of, and, and then they are our helpers and they are on our side and they're powerful beings is the belief system. So the most famous example of this is Sugawara, Sugawara Michizane, which many of you may know as Tenjin. If Tenjin is one of the most popular Shinto shrine systems in the country. There's thousands of Tenjin shrines in Kyoto. There's Kitano Tenmangu. Tenmangu shrines are, are Tenjin shrines. And that's an image of Sugawara Michizane there at, at the bottom. And uh, he was a famous statesman who was unjustly accused of wrongdoing and died in exile. And then disaster struck the capital and lightning struck the residences of the people who uh, unjustly accused him and people died from that. And so they thought he was an ondrio. They thought he was a vengeful spirit. Now, over time, of course, he's, he's very beloved. He's mostly known as the god of scholarship students across the country pray to him. Also the God of being unjustly accused, for example, you know, when you're suffering from something you didn't do. So people pray to him for that too, to, to have the fortitude to, to get through that. Uh, overcoming trials and hardships. So this is Adare Tenjin Yama, one of the floats, their display area. They had a fire in their neighborhood, uh, probably caused by lightning and hail miraculously fell and put out the fire. And there was a, a mysterious statue of Sugawara Michizane am amidst the hail. So he became the deity for this float. Now you'll notice these gohei, these golden zigzag things. These are a Shinto device that are waved like this. Uh, a Shinto priests may hold them and, and it's considered that they purify a space. This is relevant to us as modern beings because this is really what modern psychology tells us that we all have a psychological shadow and uh, you know a dark side bad habits and uh, 
you know, not so nice qualities that show up from time to time. And, and modern psychology says that if we embrace these aspects of ourselves, integrate them, there are actually positive qualities beneath that that are waiting to emerge. Sometimes it's called the golden shadow. So if we're not afraid of the darkness and, and look into it and explore, there's usually a, a lotus amid the muck, so to speak. And uh, so I find that fascinating that th this is basically the same belief system in this ancient Shinto paradigm. And the Gion festival is essentially a gigantic Shinto ritual. Shinto is Japan's native indigenous belief system. It's a kind of animism or, or shamanism um, belief in spirits. And it's got a uh, um, hundreds or perhaps thousands of smaller Shinto rituals within it. So more than a million people go each year, not this year because of COVID, they ask people not to gather, but uh, more than a million people go to each year to, to give you an idea of the scale. So this is Abura Tenjin Yama. The deity I was talking about before is revered at the second shrine as well. So here you can see the gohei are attached to the float. So remember this purifies the space. The float travels through Kyoto, does a, a circuit around central Kyoto. And so it's basically purifying the space as it goes. Many or most of the floats have these gohei. So just think of this belief system. Somebody believed that these floats would go through and purify this space, okay? And they're taking the shrine with them to uh, Tenjin-san. So, uh, so in a sense, Tenjin-san is also going through the streets of Kyoto, bringing his benevolence, bringing his strength to overcome hardship, bringing his scholastic ability, academic abilities. There's a lot to do in the Gion Festival with this communication with other worlds, these, these aspects of existence that we can't see with, with these eyes. So this is called a shingi. The pole here is called a shingi, and the shin is for kami, for deity, and gi is tree, so it means God's tree. And at the very top of this, you can just make it out as a sword. And this is a mystical sword uh, made in the 10th century, and uh, there's a no play about this sword and the sword maker, and it is believed to heal, be able to cure illnesses. This sword was uh, supposedly when the sword maker forged this sword, he was visited by the gods and they said, your swords will have this power to heal illnesses. And it miraculously healed, healed the daughter of the emperor. And um, the sword is atop this god's pole. And so it's kind of the, the belief then is that the sword is covering a lot of territory with these with this magical healing ability, with this mystical healing ability. As you can imagine, this is kind of like a divine lightning rod, this God's tree where it's connecting the earth and the sky, right? The, the Gion Festival is supplicating the deities, please help us to overcome this illness and this suffering. And, and it's these rods that are communicating there, maybe like radio antenna or satellite so, so that we can connect with those other realms. This is a makoshi, a portable shrine. So there are resident deities at the Yasaka shrine and the, it is the Susano no Mikoto, the god of storms. So remember it's rainy season, god of storms. And his partner is the goddess of rice. And the third deity at the Yasaka shrine is there are many children. And so these three deities are brought in the Gion festival. This is the bringing, this is one of the rituals brought to central Kyoto, where they bless the people for the summer. So the god of storms, they, they bring the god of storms in, invite him into central Kyoto, help us get through this rainy season so that we don't suffer from illness or help us overcome this illness. This is a float Ayagasa Boko. And uh, so each float then has its own rituals that they do. This is a Shinto priest blessing the space. He's pouring some sake, I think, onto the road there. And these people are doing their own. This is Kikusui Boko, and he's he's pouring some sake onto the Shingi pole that we saw previously as a purification. It, they build it uh, horizontally, and then they hoist it upright. 
it's a lot about purification as you know shinto is a lot about purification and it's really purifying these shadow elements purifying um illness right illness is is about a kind of we can say negativity we can say we know that a bad attitude weakens our immune system so it's about purifying this it's so important that we lead virtuous lives to inspire these spirits to help us and and that our immune systems are strong, right? Because we're feeling good. These are sakaki leaves there at the top. Those are also used in Shinto rituals. They're believed to be purifying. And in this ritual, this one float kankoboko lets anybody tie these. Um, they're similar to the gohei. They have a different word when they're small and white like that. But, but you make a prayer when you tie it on and then you can tie it. And um, then that be, you're adding to the prayers of, of the Gion Festival. Just to give you an idea of the layers and layers of this and, and all the different uh, ways that people are participating. These are Yamabushi. They are adherents of Shugendo, which is a kind of mystical Buddhist sect. It is Buddhism, but they spend a lot of time in nature and they do a lot of ascetic practices like um, days or weeks or longer at a time in nature, sometimes uh, living off of the land in nature and a lot of hiking through the mountains and so on. And uh, there are two floats related to the history of Yamabushi. And they go every year and pay their respects to those floats. And they also go around and they chant the Heart Sutra at different floats and different places throughout the Gion Festival. Now, the Heart Sutra is considered one of the most profound teachings in the entire Buddhist canon and they go around chanting the Heart Sutra throughout. So this is a kind of birth symbolism. They, they make these hoops and it's considered when you jump through this hoop, you get purified. So that straw has been blessed. You can see the white zigzags there, which indicates purification by Shinto ritual. This is a fire puja, a fire ceremony. You can write your prayers on a gomataki, on a wooden stick, and then they'll burn them in a ritual so our, our prayers go up to the heavens. And this is Naginataboko, the first float in the procession on July 17th today. And here, the Chigosan, that's a small boy with the crown in the front. He's holding a sword and he's cutting a sacred Shinto rope. And with this ceremony, he's officially opening the sacred space of the Gion Festival. And in a sense, he's, he's moving from the human world into the God realm by, by cutting this rope. Like now, we, we're, now we're entering this different kind of space. And the Chigo are a very popular part of the Gion Festival and they're remnants of what once would have been child mediums. In many cultures around the world, um, because children are considered more pure, they were considered the best vehicles to, to be possessed by deities. And we see that today in the Chigo, the remnants of that today in the Chigo. A very prominent feature of the Gion Festival is the music called the Ohayashi or the Gionbayashi. And this music comes from ancient No music, which probably even the predecessor to No. And that music was basically designed to induce a trance in the no actor. So similar to ancient Greek theater, an actor wasn't just playing a part, you know, memorizing lines and, okay, now I'm going to be another person. They were really considered to embody the spirit of whatever role they were portraying and taking the community through some kind of communal catharsis related to the themes of that performance. And, and No still performs this function today. And the Gion Festival has a long association with, with No, um, including this music. I kid you not, the space inside a float is not a lot bigger than a, a spacious SUV. And they put between 40 and 50 men crammed inside that space. And I've, I've expressed dismay at that. I'm like, wow, 50 guys? And, and they said, oh, it's really important that we be so jam-packed because otherwise we'd fall out. <laughs> but so these men are, are playing music designed to induce a trance, crammed together, very hot, humid conditions. And then they're going on this procession in, in the midday sun for about three or four hours. So just imagine the kind of state that would put people in basically an altered state. <laughs>
<laughs> in case it's not obvious. These men aren't crammed into a small space, but they have been walking on the hot pavement for three or four hours and not, not just strolling and, you know, I'll go and stand in the shade now. You know, they're presenting themselves as representatives of their floats and of their deities in a way. So they're really trying to maintain good posture and stay in a line. So staying focused. So just imagine staying focused and walking for three or four hours in very hot and humid conditions. It's really a rite of passage. It's really a, a kind of um, ascetic practice. These men are at the front of the float, directing the float. You can get a sense for how much energy that they're expending for what ends up being a half day journey. And here you get a sense of there being 40 or 50 guys packed in there together. I think this was at the beginning. They look pretty fresh here. And it isn't all arduousness, right? It's really important to say that the sense of community is, is also a joyful one. They're, they're having a nice time together. So these guys are cheering on. Some other men are performing a ritual and they're saying, it, it is a celebration. And the role of the community is, is a very essential and profound one. This is called Kamiyosobi. It's a traditional Shinto dance. Kamiyosobi means play for the gods. And it's basically a dance designed to please the gods, right? Because remember, we're trying to get them on our side. I like this photo because it shows the tools of the trade, right? We've got our exacto knives and our wire and our string, and then we've got our purifying salt and our purifying sakaki leaves. So we remember these are these, when we talk about purification and stuff, these are tools, these are tools of the trade. This is Kanon, the Buddhist Bodhisattva of Compassion. Although it's a Shinto ritual, this is such an interesting part of Japanese culture. We think of it as being kind of homogenous, but there's a very, very diverse side to Japanese culture where everything is welcome. So Shinto ritual, but Buddhism is very much a part of it. This is from Minami Kanon Yama. They would take the Bodhisattva of Compassion, Yoryu Kanon, who specializes in healing. And she's often showed ho holding a willow uh, branch. And willow has been used for hundreds or thousands of years to cure fevers. And fevers was one of the symptoms of the summer illness that people in Kyoto suffered from. So she would be on the float and she's carried throughout the city. So she's radiating compassion and, and healing on, on the city and everyone who's there. And here you see the willow that Yodu Cannon is known for. And the willow is on the float and is, we hope, radiating this, its healing properties throughout the city and to all the people as it goes through the city streets. And then at the end of the festival, the willow is given out to the public. When I get a cold, I cover all my bases. I take echinacea, I take oil of oregano, I take um, whatever, I take vitamin C. I, um, so usually I can get a, prevent a cold or get over it. And I'm never quite sure what has done the trick, but together it works. And I would suggest that the Gion Festival is similar because um, they really cover all of their bases. That's Mahayana. This is a float with a Zen theme at Hakuraku Tenyama, so about great Zen teachings, which is about emptiness, and uh, it's believed that emptiness is essentially compassion. There's a strong Taoist element in the Gion Festival. This is a, a textile at Tokusayama. If you're familiar with Taoism, you'll recognize these stories. These are Taoist immortals, and you can recognize them. One Taoist immortal is often shown with a dancing toad, as we see here. And uh, another is shown with a, a youth, as we see here. And Taoism has a very strong theme about, well, the Taoist immortals. It's about immortality. It's about vitality. Another Taoist immortal recognized by his legend about him riding a fish. So Kyoto Gion Festival supporters would have commissioned these textiles. So they're kind of inviting these Taoist teachings on vitality and immortality to help overcome this fear of death from the summer sickness. This float is related to a Confucian tale and Confucian is a lot about virtue. Right. And remember, we said that if we lead virtuous lives, we can inspire the vengeful spirits to become helpful spirits. 
This is actually a Christian textile uh, imported mysteriously from Europe when Japan was closed. That's a whole nother interesting story. And this shows a scene from the Old Testament. That's the original on the right and a reproduction on the left. So again, it's the Old Testament. So Judaism also, anything that will help is welcomed in. This textile, that's Kufic script around the border, which is uh, Muslim, uh, Islam. So it probably says, praise Allah, praise Allah, praise Allah. And that textile shows Greek paganism. I was talking about uh, covering our bases when we're going to catch a cold. So you can see how the Gion Festival communities were really covering their bases. We'll invite any spirits in, any teachings in that, that might help us through this epidemic. Here's a textile of the phoenix, and the phoenix in Chinese culture traditionally represents virtue. Another very common symbolism in the Gion Festival is the dragon. And Kyoto was founded on Feng Shui, and each direction has a guardian. In the east is the blue dragon. And it's believed that in Kyoto, the blue dragon lives beneath the Yasaka Shrine main hall. And Yasaka Shrine is the parent shrine of the Gion Festival. And the dragon rules the element of water. It's all, it's this incredible weaving together of, of calling these different types of energies in for protection and for health. So the more I studied the Gion Festival, I'm, the more I realized uh, it wasn't just about the objects. It was really about the intention, about the intention of uh, trying to share uh, compassion really for people who are struggling, for people who are suffering from illness. And that person might be myself. And I, I really let go of trying to get things and, and started to think more about how I could contribute. And, and that's uh, my, my book was born out of that. It's called The Gion Festival Exploring Its Mysteries. And uh, you can get a free excerpt of the book on my website, gionfestival.org. And it's also available on Amazon. And I really set out to try to write the book in a way that was supportive to the people going to the festival so they'd have an enjoyable experience and also supportive to the amazing community that puts on the festival every year. It is basically an act of service, um, mostly almost entirely volunteer. I feel like I've had my own journey of... Uh, converting a, a spirit that was, uh, I was initially really interested in what I could get from going to the festival and have gone through my own process of that being transformed into how I could contribute. And uh, I have to say, it just feels so much better to be on this side of it, the, the contributing side. Many of you may have heard Kyoto is going through some acute challenges uh, in recent years with what's being called over-tourism. And uh, that of course is a challenge in many places, maybe not amidst COVID, but in many of the world's beautiful cultural capitals. And I think that the solution really lies with us. It's really about the, the population is not getting any smaller. So there's no reason that I have more of a right to visit a, a place than anybody else. So limiting visitors is, is a challenging prospect. But I, I do believe that if, if we go to places with this kind of view in mind, that, that we're participating in the culture of the place that we're visiting, we're not voyeurs, we're not people outside who are just watching someone else um, live their lives. But while we're there, we're actually temporarily members of that community. And while we're there, how can we contribute to that being a pleasant experience for everyone? And I'd like to suggest that that makes for a much more pleasant experience for ourselves as well. And uh, when we think about, well, it's a great question to ask yourself. I, I think I've shared some of uh, what my beliefs are about what I would like to bring when I'm a temporary member of a community, but I, I encourage you to ask yourself that question, right? If when you're visiting a, a place, what is it that you would like to be sharing? 
as a visitor, as a temporary member of that community. And I, I've found that to be a very fruitful reflection. I wish everyone very good health and well-being and a speedy end to the COVID pandemic.